Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode 17. Here with me today, we have Orion. Hey, what's up? We have Matt. Hi. And from all the way over in Pennsylvania, Wes has joined us. Hello, Internet. You haven't been on since our first episode, right? That is correct. Been a long time coming. Yeah. That is a, sh- that is a shame. It is a shame. Wes uh, used to live with us, but then moved to Pennsylvania, and, well, you were in Arizona for a while for your job and didn't have your recording device, although since our technical difficulties have made that moot anyway, we should have just done it before. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, we probably should have just done it, but that's okay. Uh, Yeah, I was in Arizona for like 75 days, but now I'm back in Pittsburgh and happy as a clam, but I still haven't played any board games, so it's probably been... Eight months since oh, I played a board game. That's awful. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, we're glad to have you back on. Today, we're going to be talking about impossible themes. And this is something I thought of, but I think while I was like laying in bed. And I'm like, what are things in board gaming specifically that are more, or maybe impossible? We'll get into that later, but very, very difficult to do thematically. Because board games do a lot of things very well, but I think there are some inherent limitations with the medium that make certain things more difficult. Uh, Before we go into that, I do want to mention, as uh, I mentioned last time, that uh, we've recently started on Patreon to try to get some funds for the Thoughtful Gamer. Uh, So if you do enjoy this podcast, make sure to check out patreon.com slash the Thoughtful Gamer. There'll also be a link at the bottom of the video. But let's talk about some impossible things. You know, there were two that I came up with. And then, was it you, Wes, who added the third one? Yeah, that was me. Yeah, and I'm super curious about that one. But let's start with the first one that I thought of that really Wait, can, interests can, can, me. Can, can, you, can you set the stage a little bit? Because I sure. think this, this is really interesting. But what does theme mean and what does impossible mean? Those are my two questions. <laughs> I'm using these words loosely. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. But, but seriously. But theme in, yeah. in, in terms of the, the idea, right? So you have, in, in board gaming, you have purely abstract games, which even then they're not purely abstract. Like Go is probably the most abstract game that mm-hmm. I can think of that is fairly popular because it's just the stones. But even then, it's about area control. It's about positioning. It has kind of militaristic themes to it. And then you have modern board games, which are about something. So I'm looking at the shelf here. We have Descent, which is about Dungeon Crawl. We have Churchill, which is about the conferences uh, during World War II. Um, That's the theme. And more deeply, I think what I'm talking about in this particular context is kind of emotions or choice ideas, right? Because board games are all about choice. And things that that really interest me is when the yes. game presents you with a choice that elicits the feelings of the theme. So we talk about Twilight Struggle a lot, or at least I do, because it feels like the Cold War. The yeah. choices that you make and the decisions that you're presented with are the same kind of decisions that that leaders in the actual Cold War felt also, just you know, on a less severe scale. So that's what I'm talking about when I mean the theme it's the idea of the 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 way the game is an analog of something in real life does that answer your question at all that's a good start yeah an impossible i mean i'm going to present some ideas well i think that the impossible part is interesting as i was thinking about this put Um, a question mark after it yeah themes impossible (laughs) (laughs) oh i think the ways that board games are or are not or close to being impossible in certain ways is interesting so let's jump right into the first one. This is the first one I thought about because, specifically because I've been thinking about how to solve this problem. And that is the first theme I'm calling real market activity. So what I mean when I say this is that there are certainly games, like games are very economic, board games are, especially the Euro games. Sure, yeah. Um, but even any kind of game with choices is inherently economic because economics is about choice. But we have things in terms of simulating the actual market. We have Power Grid, which does supply and demand pretty well, where it has different resources, resources, and as people buy them, the price increases, so that simulates that mechanism pretty well. We have games that do trading, which is obviously a very important part of any kind of economic market, uh, like Catan, but 
I haven't seen a game yet that captures kind of a very specific dynamic in markets. And that is that there's trading in markets because it's mutually beneficial. And therefore, markets markets are almost a cooperative exercise. Right. And and that's what drives the price and the value of the things being traded. What do you mean? Because I'm benefiting... Because if we're trading, we both benefit. Um, The thing that I have and the thing that you have, they gain their... Like their trading value is dependent on how much value you you give the thing that I want and I give. Sure. The thing. Yeah, on the on the aggregate, the value, the market value is emergent. Based, sure. Based on what? Yes. Yeah. So I think in any game that's going to simulate an actual market, there has to be some way to trade because that's a fundamental action within markets. You have to be able to have exchanges. But the problem is that board games are zero-sum in the end. So the idea of a market is that it's not zero-sum because we value things differently. If there's a free trade to be made, both sides profit. So it's, it's inherently not zero-sum. But a board game, at the end, there's a winner and there are losers. I think you're misconstruing that just a little bit because you're saying... A board game is zero sum, but all of the actions throughout the board game are not necessarily zero sum. If oh, you're sure. trading resources in Catan, you're both getting resources that you can use for things, and you're both benefiting there. And you know, trading in you know some other games, you're both benefiting. At the end of the game, we have an arbitrary victory points or something because we don't want to continue. But everything leads forever. up to that definable. But in Catan, we see that precisely manipulate the way people trade and interact, right? Because at the beginning of the game, everyone's doing a lot of trading, usually. And we have a lot of free exchange, for lack of a better word, between resources. And that's, you know, that's good mutually beneficial trading. But once someone gets close to winning the game, all of a sudden, no one trades with them anymore. Like, it works for a while, but because of precisely this thing, it stops working well in Catan. Does that make sense? Sure. But couldn't you just, couldn't you say thematically that's because that player is developing too much of a monopoly on the island and the other, it's like a competition thing then? It's stretching it a little bit. I mean, that's yes. stretching it. And that's not how monopolies work, really. I, 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 yeah. I'm just saying, in the terms of, yeah. in that situation of if you were all trying to develop this island, what would cause you to stop wanting to trade with someone? Well... Yeah. Presumably, they're getting too much influence or something. The only the real world um, corollary there that I can think of would be like everyone trades with Walmart, <laughs> but mm. there's a there's a kind of a backlash of like because it's so ubiquitous. I want to trade with Ma and Pa shop on the corner instead. Well, I mean, the thing in Catan is that's you know the scale's tiny, so. <laughs> Right. The, the scale's tiny and there's no consequences for not trading. I mean, if you just look at history and say, well, mm-hmm. what happens if Portugal doesn't trade with the Roman Empire? The, the answer is that the Roman Empire invades Portugal and Portugal dies. Like, it's <laughs> it, 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 there's no equivalent of that in Catan. There's no stakes. And also your people might starve or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, but I think it's still subject to... The problem that ultimately it's a zero-sum game. You have many, many non-zero-sum games in Catan, but those get skewed by the fact that someone is the winner. Right. And there's nothing really like that in, in kind of a real real world market. This is weird. I'm almost getting the like calculus problem of like you can approximate a definite end, but like it's like it, a limit. Like limit? like the real world is continuous. Yeah. Right. But so like we can come up with these approximations, but maybe you're right. Maybe it's that definite ending of Catan is just too much of a looming thing that there's no way to have a real market in Catan. I guess that's what you're saying. Right. That's what I'm saying. And that's that's exactly what my second point was, is that there's an end point in a game. I mean... The only the only close thing in like a real world economy that has an endpoint is if you're like building a business specifically to get bought out, which would be an interesting game concept, I suppose. 
Because that would be <laughs> that would be the end. <laughs> that would be a good game. Man, I, gotta, I, I would I call that Silicon Valley the board game. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Venture capitalists. But but given you know most people aren't doing that when they're like running a business or something. Right. They're trying to make a sustainable you know business that's going to last in the long term. And even if like the end point is like your own death or something in the game of the actual okay. economy, the game of life. right? You people still make decisions based on like inheritance or like creating a yeah. trust or something. Can I throw another? Well, let me think. Can I throw another game out, or do you want to go? Yeah, through go for it. Well, uh, Pit comes to mind. That's Pit? not. We've never played Pit. I've played it. It's it's the game where it's like they're just trading. cards that are resources. The to win the game, you have to get a card, a hand full of the same card. Okay. And just everyone just has cards. So there's like sets of yeah. eight resources equal, to, and you play. You know, if you have six people, you play with six sets or whatever. Yeah. And you're trading around three. You like say I'm trading one, two, three, or four cards, and they have to be the same thing. But the other person doesn't know what they are. Oh, I think I played this once a long yeah, time and, ago. And so I'm just throwing this out there because wait, but you're trying Pit, to collect all of one. Yeah. Thing? Pit that's like a backwards. Itself. It's like a backwards. Yeah, you start really is. generalized and become yeah. specialized. But <laughs> Pit fashions itself as Wall Street the game, basically. Okay. Of this trading. And it's just kind of chaos around the table with three, 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 and then Orion has three. And oh, so it's real time. So I play. Yeah. And yeah. You're just yelling at each other and you throw cards back and forth. Um, and sure. You're, you're like, oh, that's not what I needed. And, um, I don't have a big point about Pit, but that's just. That's when you when you think of market forces, that that's the game that comes to mind. It's an old game that tries to yeah, yeah. I thought it fashion game. itself that way. I don't mm-hmm. know that it does it particularly. Well, there's also Chinatown, which we haven't played but we know about, which is basically you're trying to accumulate the most money and there's property and you can just make whatever trades you want. I think in Chinatown, okay. unlike Catan, there's hidden information. Okay. Or like your victory condition is hidden, so you can't... In Catan, there's a bit. You can hide the victory points from cards. But I think in Chinatown, all of your money is hidden, so you don't really know who's winning. Which I suppose is an elegant solution to that problem. If you honestly don't know, you can probably find... Or you can probably make a good guess at who's winning. But by making that hidden, I think that helps solve the problem a bit. Right, but that's not how a real market or a real economy works. Like the in in a real market or a real economy, the winner is pretty much always evident. Sure, but in a game sense, by hiding that information, you get rid of the Catan problem, where everyone just stops trading with the leader. So I think well, you it's, actually, hob- it's hobble the leader, right? I mean, that's the name yeah. of the mechanic. Yeah, and so I think it actually would probably create more market friendly actions and thoughts on the part of players. Okay, here's where I'm confused about what it means to be impossible i mean these are approximations of a free market but anything in a board game is an approximation of, sure of something so so why why do you think it's impossible well here's what i'm thinking right so in any kind of economic board game it's it's some kind of engine building usually right yeah you do things to help your income to be able to do better things to improve your income and so there's always at least from what I can see, there's always a very specific pattern. To it's it. always a means. The The economy is always a well, means. Well, no, there's always a pattern to it, right? You're, okay. You start by trying to get you know, income. Uh, usually you're trying to build the engine, and then you try to maximize your victory condition right at the end. And everyone else, if you're the leader, is trying to stop you from doing that. And it's that specific thing where all of a sudden you turn a switch and now you don't care about the long term. You all of a sudden care about the short term and right. everyone stops trading or stops trying to help you. Yeah. It's that that where it all of a sudden just goes completely off the rails thematically for trying to simulate a market. A market. Yeah. Because because it's zero sum and because there's no endpoint. So that's, I guess, the impossibility in quotation marks I'm presenting. And I think... Well, let's go down. I have a couple of partial solutions written here of how I think if I was trying to design a game to get past this problem, okay, what would I do? What are you gonna say? Well, well, it's it's a hard problem because okay, you are you're playing a game, right? So usually the market in a game serves a purpose for the game. So one of the problems you get here is in order to have like 
a fully fleshed out free market as a part of a game, then like, then all your win conditions and all of your, like, I, you probably need other mechanics that surround that. But if, if the free market is given that much freedom in the game, then all of a sudden your game is, ex- has to expand to fit that. Does that make sense? Do you understand no, what I'm saying? because all you, all you need is... Because in any of these all games... All you need is trading, and you have it. Yeah, but in any of these games that we're talking about, like Catan or whatnot, if Catan was infinite, which is a fantasy of mine... <laughs> <laughs> Just playing Catan forever? Mega Catan. Me- uh, yes. Millions of hexes. <laughs> um, then, okay, so if Catan was infinite... Then and you weren't ending at eleven victory points. Then in a sense that market all of a sudden is open ended. Yeah, but it yeah I don't know it's the That's game. What I'm saying though. okay the game the game has to expand in some way. So when designing a game, unless your point is to simulate the market, the, the market's only serving a, some other purpose. I think I get what you're saying. Maybe I'm saying. The same thing that you're saying, coming from a different way. Perhaps. I think the, the, the point you're raising of saying a board game can't simulate the market is a little silly because like, they're fundamentally different things. And the market, you're, you're saying by definition, the market is unbounded by time, has many parties, and has this mutual trading, and there's no ulterior motives going on other than yeah. profit. Well, so the first barrier let me, let is that everyone in. has the same end in a board game. Well, let me rein in the parameters a bit. Okay. Simulating a market, okay, that, that's broad. What I'm saying is that it doesn't simulate economic market activity or choices in very specific ways because... So in other words, there's, there's no game that I can think of where... I'm honestly planning for the long term the whole time, or I care about the long term the whole time. Okay. And there's no game where, like, the, in all of these market games, there's always a point where you all of a sudden switch all of your priorities yeah. to just getting points or whatever, the, or money, or whatever the victory condition is. But couldn't you say that of every board game ever? Well, I mean, every board game is a facsimile. I mean, the the thing that we're questioning is, is it a reasonable enough facsimile that you could call it a market or, or you know, like to call it an actual market? Um, or is it a, a hobbled or handicapped facsimile that is insufficient? I guess this stems from me really wanting to have a game yeah, you... that doesn't have that thing, like that doesn't have that point where... Right you all of a sudden switch from like acting like you're growing a business or growing an <laughs> economy, and then all of a sudden you become incredibly short-term focused. I mean, Does I, that think, make sense? I, think to, I think to simulate that, it would have to not be a short-term thing. I mean, what you see, what's the one game, broad definition, that simulates a market better than any other game? Mm. Wes would be the one to know this. Power Grid, if we... House no, I, trading. I, I meant broader <laughs> definition of game. Eve online. Right? Oh, yeah. So, like, online games that are persistent, and the things that you get them are persistent, and any the thing any that... large MMO like that. The wealth you wow, have, have both in in-game currency and in-game things... Items, yeah. ...persists items, as long as you have it. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, items, ships. Right? Yeah. So, so time is the thing that's missing. Right. Well, let's get to my solutions then, because I think we can get close to a board game. Okay. Because right? that's okay, the okay. whole point of this, okay, right? Okay, good, good. There are, that's what we there want. are apparent yeah. inherent other limitations. Other than hockey, this is a board, board game, game podcast. What's that? I said, other than hockey, this is a board game podcast. <laughs> no, because the point the point of this discussion and why I wanted to bring this up, because there are apparent inherent limitations with the medium. Okay. Yeah, and yeah, I yeah. want to see if we can work past it okay. without turning it into, uh, you know, EVE Online. So, here's my idea, okay? <laughs> to get past the definite endpoint problem, you, d- you have kind of a, a system at the end of the game that simulates, you know, quickly, without playing, kind of future progress. So, in other words, you don't have the game end with the winner having 
the most points or the most money at that point, but you have it be the person who has the most, you know, if you're if the game's about like growing a company, the most stable, you know, steadily growing company, or you have some kind of parameters that way. Mm-hmm. You're giving me a really weird face. I have thoughts. Let's share your thoughts. But okay, but that's what games with economies do anyway. So so immediately when you started saying this, I said, oh, so at the end of the game, you need like some sort of um, financial analysis. You know, like you would go to finance advisor and say, like, I'm thinking of investing in these two companies. Let's look at all the, you know, the ratios and stuff. I don't know how any of that works, right? Okay, sure. You know, like evaluating stocks. I don't sure. Know. Yeah, if, you're, yeah. if you're trying to make an investment, you, you know. look at their price to earnings ratio and their you know their yeah. balance sheet you can look at all of that and say is this a sound investment what are the prospects of the future things like that but the things that would go into that analysis are the things that you're building up in the game so like at the end of scythe the things you're getting points for are all the components that make up your economy so it really is an analysis of how good your economy would be long term it's not perfect. It's not exactly that. No, but I think games could do better. Scythe actually probably does a decent job at it. Kind of. The problem is, like, in, in a board game universe, mm-hmm. you would look at the stock market and say, okay, what a, what company has the most money? That's the one. But that's not how it is. It's, no, there's okay, a whole right. bunch of other factors okay, into right. it, so, a healthy company so or a healthy economy. To improve, improve that, you can do the Scythe thing, you would just apply, like, you get a, a certain bonus victory points for your recurring income and or whatever, your assets. And those things would also go into the victory point salad. I think it's that victory point salad, salad thing that includes all the different parts of your economy that, that gets you to where you want to go. Yeah. Or, like, viticulture, if you counted the resids, is more important than just money because the way it is usually i try to build them up and then like the last turn i just trash them all to convert them to victory points yeah right (laughs) but if you if you counted them differently then that could be part of saying we've built up a stable wine empire or enterprise or whatever yeah so i'm imagining a game okay where you're running a company and there's some kind of but it'd be really awesome to have literally a simulated end game where you build up like a stability modifier. Okay. And then like a growth modifier. And then your stability modifier determines, like you roll some dice to see like projected growth into the future. And then if you're more stable, well, you might not have the stability thing, but have like a growth modifier that determines the victory rather than just whoever has the most money at this point. And I think that would do something to get... So, so rather of, rather than measure the outputs of the engine, measure the internal parameters of the engine. Yes. Yeah. Or I, I, like I, I, me- measure the health and the longevity of the engine. Right. I think you're. I think you're right. I think that's what you have to do. I think that. Well, Scythe is the game that came to mind, and I'm not really thinking of other ones, but that do something like that. Or yeah. In, in the problem. Well, the problem with Scythe is. It's not an economic theme. That's like, I don't know. Well, that's fine. Don't worry about that. Yeah. Right, because this is this also brings up another problem, or not problem, but issue with board game design is that if you have an engine building game, you want the game to end right when it, you know, right when it's achieved maximum fun. Because well, if it okay. ra- rails out of control, the people who haven't built a good engine just have a bad time. But that comes back to the point of the board game is to be a fun activity. And the point of the market is to create wealth, <laughs> right? Yeah, Something absolutely, Orion. Orion is 200% correct. Are you guys saying that I have a crazy fever dream here that will never be realized? <laughs> I'm just saying the way you're framing it is you're kind of creating these contradictions. Yeah, you're framing it in a weird way. Yeah. And you definitely picked We're... the worst theme on this list to talk about first. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, I think, we, I think we buried the lead a little bit there. But I, I think that, Mark, the, what you're talking about this is Patrick Bateman's dream board game, you know. No, like this what, is what if, okay. Here, well, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just saying that it's it to to have a true market simulation. You're going to have to have people who play that game who 
truly enjoy accurate market simulation and have lots of fun with accurate market simulation. Yes. And that demographic is small and vicious. I mean, thinking and about maybe it, it doesn't it, play maybe it doesn't play board games. I don't think it would be that hard to do. Like you basically need to understand investing and then yeah. Well, there might be a game out there that does this. I know there are heavier have you played, economic uh, games. Cash flow. Cash flow? No. It's this educational game by. Do you know the Rich Dad Poor Dad books? Nope. Okay. It's a series of finance books that this guy Robert Kiyosaki wrote. I read them a number of years ago. He created this educational board game to try to teach people these principles that he was talking about. And one for him, one of the biggest points that he makes is an asset is something that puts money in your pocket on a regular basis. Sure. Okay. Some people say an asset like a house has value. But the difference is he's saying an asset is a rental property versus your home. So he would say your house is not an asset, it's a liability because you spend money on it every month, while a rental property is an asset because it gives you money every month. Okay. Assuming you've you know made a good investment. Sure. So the game is you go around this board and you have opportunities to buy these different investment properties or you know stock or whatever, and the goal is to get to a point where you have enough income, residual income, that you don't have to work your job anymore. And so you don't need your, your paycheck. And then you can graduate to the, the fast track around the outside where you everything gets multiplied by 10 or something. Interesting. Hmm. <laughs> right. I think I think educational game is probably this the subgenre that you'll find the best. When I get rich and famous making the Mark Davis business market simulation game if you want to do that mark write a computer program to grab all the data from the stock market and like you know tweak it to be your in-game currencies or companies yeah and then people like buy and sell or trade and build in that in that world and then you have all the data and the world and the continuation and everything and the details that you could do that with yeah, but that's not a board game. I want to solve this problem. Wes, well, so I think you're right. Game. I think the people that want to play this game are investing in the stock market. <laughs> right, right. They're, they're playing. They're playing the game in real life, possibly. And you can. There's even like stock market simulation apps where you're not actually spending real money. You just, you know, you start with a portfolio of like ten thousand fake dollars and you buy stuff and yeah, uh, yeah. you know. And Orion, you know what's really funny is that those games are usually used to train um, machine learning models for oh. <laughs> rapid trading. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, that, huh. yeah. Those are some, that, that's that's a really interesting thing. I, I researched into that a little bit when I did futures trading years ago. What about Millennium Blades? Millennium Blades is interesting. It's a different kind of secondary market. <laughs> that one actually does pretty well. I've only because played it once, have... and I completely ignored the secondary market. Well, <laughs> it, it doesn't work well with two players, but with more than two players, the market secondary market, you can have mutually beneficial trades. It's very hidden how much any given trade will help your opponent vis-a-vis -vis, you know, your success. So while it does have an endpoint, it doesn't but really... The endpoint the end isn't it does... like the market stops at this point. It's you're playing these three tournaments, and yeah. the, the market's kind of going on on the side. And then you finish the last tournament where you're like, well, there's no more reason to keep playing. It's not right. like the market the, there's no There's no change in your strategy necessarily because the end is coming. Because you know so much is hidden about your opponents and your goal is the same each time. It's also not an engine. That's kind of an... Not really an engine building. It's a, okay. Money and Blades is I, actually decent. I, I want to talk about different themes because I think on the list of... On the list of themes, I think this is slightly below hockey. All so, right, so can I... Ahead. Yeah, yeah let, let me do the intro to this because it, it came to me just today. Um, basically, I, I, I've i had a fair amount of experience with scale conflict games like Risk, Twilight Struggle, Axis and Allies. Um, and even to a certain degree, you could make uh, an argument that Power Grid and Monopoly, those games are also scaled conflict, where the the concept and the overall theme of the game is significantly bigger than the board itself. Of like In Monopoly, you're, you're trying to control a city. Um, in Power Grid, you're trying to control an electrical company, Axis and Allies, obviously World War II simulation, Twilight Struggle, Cold War, where it's these huge conflicts that should provoke a lot of emotion and should provoke a lot of trepidation. And they're not 
Like they, they, they should be real brain chewers. But in my experience, it's almost impossible to get that kind of tension and excitement out of those board games to like try to eke it out, even even if you're seeking that kind of tension. And I guess this is more of an emotionally charged theme um, is what I'm getting at, that, that it doesn't. It doesn't throw into you the emotion that would be necessary for something like controlling the outcome of the Cold War. So, and you're, I, saying, I, so you're saying in terms of it, it can't provide the emotion of like putting lives at risk, not it can't create the complexity of the situation. That's correct. That's correct. Like the and, and so in that theme of overwhelming large conflict that it doesn't stimulate in the way that like say age of empires or empire earth or like an RTS typically on a PC or something like that would stimulate at, at least for me. I mean, maybe that's not the experience that you guys have had and that's why I brought this up for discussion. Hmm. So how do you guys feel about those mass conflict games like Axis and allies and twilight struggle? I have a quick thought and then I'll bow out this. I think this gets at the medium that you're using is going to, shade the way that you interpret an event and and so board games are good at kind of counting units and simulating you know unit to unit combat board Um, games are good at puzzles they're good at puzzles exactly so when you look at a conflict through the medium of board games that's how you understand the conflict so if you're looking to experience conflict which i think is a good i i think that's almost a good definition of theme is you you want to experience something the i guess the the board game is going to shade your experience towards whatever that medium is good at but i'm I'm curious wes what you what you feel in in an rts like age of empires that you're not feeling in a strategic board game when i look at a strategic board game i i mean we we brought this up um a little bit in the notes about fog of war that in most RTSs you can't see your opponent's units. So having the, the information completely out there of like in, for instance, in power grid, I know exactly how much garbage Geesman has and how efficiently he can convert it into power or in access and allies. I know exactly how many troops that Russian stronghold has on in Moscow when I'm pushing forward is the Third Reich. Like it I I have complete information and I make complete decisions and I for some reason when I think of conflicts on that scale I almost want there to be a degree of uncertainty because I feel like that that more accurately simulates the conflict like as it would have actually unfolded. Yeah, with Fog of War, I mean, we like Triumph and Tragedy has a Fog of War me- mechanism where you can see the number of blocks your opponent has in a region, but you can't see what type or how powerful the units are. Mm-hmm. There's actually... Was and it, it, it does just because there's three sides and you kind of sit on three different corners of the board and you face your blocks towards you. So, yeah, you know, same thing with like Stratego, like yeah, same yeah, yeah, concept yeah, thing of you see their pieces, but you don't know which ones they are. Yeah, yeah. Wes, on this, you know, I agree here. And the other big thing I'll say is the, the the two biggest things I run into in 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 a board game that doesn't kind of evoke the tension at times is one, like you mentioned, the fog of war. You tend to have complete information over the whole map uh, yeah. because yeah. just from a logistics point of view, it's too hard to yeah. hide that when you're all standing sitting around a board. Even thinking of memoir, it's hard to feel. A whole bunch of tension when it, it's a. I mean, it's a small board, you know, relative to the scale of World War Two. It's hard to really feel tension when you see all of your opponents' units. Just imagine how much more cautious and scared you'd be of doing things if you couldn't see anything on the wood hexes, uh, on the forest hexes. You know, you know, what kind of sniper is hidden there? Right. Yeah, which is where right, and that, the computer games can do that because they you have kind of a master controller that can basically you know infinitely control each pixel <laughs> of the screen to either reveal or not reveal and so on. Right, and and when I when I get into a mass conflict game, I want to feel the tension of that mass conflict. If I don't want to feel that tension, I'm going to play a smaller scale game like Agricola or Viticulture or Puerto Rico or Carcassonne or Catan, where that's, it's that's the, really interesting. 
Right. That it's these micro, like really gratifying, full information gives you warm fuzzies kind of games. But if it's this huge weighty conflict, I want to feel the weight of that conflict, not turn it into a chess game. What do you think of uh, Twilight Imperium as as this sort of thing? Because you see a lot in Twilight Imperium, but it's not as unit pushing as Memoir. Yeah, I, I I think that Twilight Imperium can be intense. Um, I think it has the right degree of intensity. It's interesting that you bring up that game because I hadn't I hadn't thought about it vis a vis this question, but. I don't know. I it, it still is a jovial game, and I, I guess it comes back to the issue of fun, right? Of is it is it fun to look at a board game and be stressed and sad? Yeah, <laughs> which I mean, coming from the guy who loves Agricola, <laughs> <laughs> right, um, right. Yeah, all the examples I thought of, kind of like of games where you get the tension of not knowing. I guess are all smaller scale games, so you have. Hidden movement games like Fury of Dracula, where you have information hidden, uh, but that's not a con. Well, it's not a large scale conflict game. I know, I know, in the world of war games, that fog of war is always a a big deal of trying to figure out how to simulate that. And you know, the block war games have their thing, like Triumph and Tragedy or Sekigahara, where you can see the number but not the type. Well, what like what? information are board games good at hiding well like stuff like things that you can hold in your hand your hand of cards or or you know the stratego thing of like the back is in show or amount of resources in your pile or something like that no stratego stratego is an excellent example i i should have just looked across from me at my copy of stratego like that to me that's an excellent way of handling fog of war and i've had games of stratego that are actually very tension filled and i've enjoyed yeah Twilight Struggle, of course, is the kind of weird, unique example well, here because there's a ton like of there's a ton of tension in you know in the card play because you can't see your opponent's hand of cards, but at the same time, mm-hmm. it kind of makes a point about the Cold War in that you have these huge, massive conflicts that you just play out like another card. Yeah, the Korean War is just one of a hundred cards. Yeah, and you're like, well. I think if I trigger the Korean War now, that is strategically in my benefit. Right, right. don't think about like, well, yeah, I'm going to send 10,000 soldiers over there and some number of them are going to die or something. Yeah, I don't know if... I think I at don't some know point if there's a solution. Role play the, the emotion, emotional investment of these different events. Because even like, you can play memoir and you send your battalion of soldiers in and if you just look at them as plastic pieces, you're like, oh darn, I lost a victory point. But, I mean, at, at some point, it's a plastic piece or a wood piece. It's yeah. not a person, and you're not going to have that emotional investment unless you intentionally roleplay it that way. Right, but, and so that means the games that do it best are almost necessarily smaller scale because, like, you know, your Descent character, when they go right. down, that's impactful. Or I assume in miniatures games, you know, you know, if, yeah. I'm, play, if I'm playing uh, if you've spent- Armada and my giant Death Star goes down, that... Is impactful because of the size of it. Spent ten hours painting it the weekend before. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> or if you have like individual attributes for it and a name to a character or something, that sure. would do it. But board games can't do that on the the large scale of oh, I really feel the impact of you know those thousand people that just died. Mm-hmm. There's also uh, I haven't played it, but apparently the board game version of this war of mine is supposed to be really dark and harrowing on. You know, again, a kind of a small scale level. I'd be super interested to play it. Yeah, I was thinking about games that could go either way on this spectrum. And even though I haven't played it in probably years at this point, diplomacy seems like a really interesting right. like way of looking at this because you could, if you have a diplomacy group, you can go into it saying, okay, this is going to be a goofy damn game of diplo- diplomacy and we're just going to screw around and have fun. Or you could sit down and be like, okay, we're going to take this super seriously and treachery is going to be met with treachery and blood is going to be met with blood. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, it's all rhetorical because there's no actual combat in diplomacy, but it's, you know, you can, you can decide as a group to go into it really cutthroat or you can be really banal about it. Yeah, and I was going to say... The second thing that in these games that makes them less tension-filled is they tend to be turn-based. 
And so you can sit there for as long as you want, staring at your hand of cards or at your blocks mm. of units or at your Axis and Allies minis or whatever and think about what you want to do. Whereas diplomacy, you can sit there and think about, but then you have to secretly all simultaneously submit your bids and resolve things. Yeah. And you don't see, oh, you moved there, I'm going to move here, and then you go here, and I'm going to go here. Because that is another, like, immersion-breaking mechanic that we use for the purpose of making the board game work as a as a game, but that's a, it, it breaks away from the, you know, the thing it's trying to model. Right. Um, and another thing I just thought of is part of it could be, well, let me put it this way. A solution to Wes's problem about, you know, large scale conflict games could be just the way you, or the knowledge you have about that situation, because, you know, we're into war games. We haven't gotten much into hex and counter war games or the deeply historical hex and counter war games, but a lot of the people who are into those games are also huge students of history. Yeah. So they're playing it very precisely to simulate the conflict, not necessarily to create kind of a balanced strategic situation. Yeah. So and I think when they, I think when a particular still... battalion goes down, they you know they may know some of the names of the people in that battalion because they studied this yeah. particular fight. And they're they're still playing the game to play the game, but. The experience is informed by all of that ancillary knowledge, right? Yeah, and as a it helps them role play it. Almost. This is something I've run into of when I play my like history grand strategy games, like Europa, which is set in history from you know fourteen forty to eighteen twenty. You actually see the world of Europe and the you know the different religious wars happen and all these different events. And I've studied history enough to know some of these things, and I've re- you know I've read books about some of them, or I've read stories about this king who did something, or you know, and so there's a, a built-in kind of meaning and backdrop to all of the things you're doing, even if you conquer the entire world as an island in the Pacific by 1700 or something, right, right. you know, silly like that, because you can kind of break the game mechanics, but still, when you're playing it, you get that investment in what's happening. Whereas I've struggled to see something similar when I've played Stellaris, which is a great 4X game in space, but it's just manufactured, you just, you know, you make up a space civilization or an empire that you're playing, and it doesn't have that backdrop of real history to give it additional meaning. And I've heard some interviews from the developer of that saying that was something they specifically struggled with, because in Europa, when you play France, you know something about France, and Mm. you know, like oh yeah, they, they were rich or their kings were corrupt or their, you know, whatever. And they had the conflict with the German states or the, you know, the Spanish empires or emperors, things like that. Whereas when you're playing this space alien race, you're like, well, this is a great, but it doesn't have that same depth of, I don't know, experience or backdrop or knowledge or history or whatever to make it more rich and to make a more rich experience. Yeah. So I suppose from a game designer standpoint, the solution has got to be along the lines of really incorporating either the history or the mythos into whatever fictional world into the game, you know, giving names to things, giving backgrounds to things. Because even, like, Twilight Imperium does that really well. Absolutely. Like, when you Absolutely. when you choose an alien race in Twilight Imperium, because you can flip over the card and read the whole, like, encyclopedia entry yeah. about it... It makes it makes that combat feel more weighty. It does. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, it's, it's, it's a... In some ways, it's playing off a kind of, like, psychological weakness of humans, is that if something has a name, we care about it a lot more. <laughs> Yeah. And so yeah. you have to play off of that as a designer or as a developer of a game. Yeah, even the way that if you each of those races feelings. in Twilight Imperium are unique and the character of the race from just the you know the image that you get all the way down to how the long backstory kind of explains their uniqueness, which is then matched in their mechanics. Yeah. Well, it has to be matched in the mechanics, it has too, to or be. there has to be attributes but, or something. But it, And I think TI does a good job of that. The one that comes to mind is, like, the, what, like, the cyborg ones? The L1. The L1. L1 one, X, yeah. Yeah. The Mind Net or whatever. Yeah. I've played them and just 
felt like I'm going to go into this and just be cooled and calculating. And I mean, that's kind of silly because in a sense, we're all cool calculating because we're playing a board game. But like my experience was enhanced by that. Yeah. So. Well, and then compared to something like Quantum where each player has a different name, but there's no no distinction oh, yeah. between them. You don't care. It's red, blue, and green. That's yeah, all I yeah. can remember. Yeah, I so I think... pick the Orions because it's my name, even though I don't like the color yellow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I guess it's more than giving it a name. You have to give it some kind of identity. And yeah. so if you can yeah. give it an identity on a large scale, in a large scale game, I think yeah. you get close. Yeah. To yeah. Um, you know, one of the things in Memoir that did it, well, well, in the campaign, there are, you assign certain units as special units, and they do have a, a name. In some in some yeah, of the yeah. missions, and you're that, playing a historical scenario, a and it tells you the story yeah. beforehand, yeah. and then it's like go play it out and see what happens. Yeah. yeah, and the thing we've talked about this before, but a lot of these historical games are meant as simulations of that war or that period in history, not necessarily creating a balanced Euro economic yeah. game, which is one of the reasons I find them so fascinating. In addition to the strategic depth and you know whatever that it is also in say. Uh, you know, viticulture or Termisca or something. Here's a thing, calling back to a podcast quite a while ago, one of the things that War of the Ring has going for it better than Rebellion is that it's on a map we're familiar with. Oh, uh, yeah. Right? We have a... It's on I a, have a... You like, have a, I love Star Wars and War of the Rings fairly equally, I think. I have a much bigger like emotional connection to like Osgiliath because I know what happened in Osgiliath and I can see it right on you know right up there as like the last defense before Minas Tirith whereas in Rebellion like the spatial connection between the planets doesn't matter in Star Wars at all and therefore that sense of it's weak a bit weaker even though yeah let me I'm gonna play devil's devil's advocate here and I'm not sure exactly where I stand but in this case, the theme can work against the game as well. And I think that that tension is important here. You know, how well do the mechanics actually um, play into or against the theme? So in War of the Rings, um, I do care about all these people. Even those people, even the dwarves up in the corner. The poor dwarves who never had any action. That if... Yeah, but in like... A generic themed game, I literally would not care about those dwarves. Yeah. But because it's Lord of the Rings, I I find myself caring about them and I want to get them involved. You know, <laughs> they're people too, or whatever, you know, Sam says. <laughs> so that's, that's not no, no sorry. Okay, we're just gonna have to run it. They're people they're too. Part of this do- world dwarves too. are people too. <laughs> that's what Sam said. I was close. <laughs> that's the most generic quotation. <laughs> They're, they're part of this world, too. And so I want to get them involved in the, the war. Plus, the minis are the best. But as far as the, you know, raw mechanics of the game go, you don't need to get them involved in some cases. All I'm trying to say is I think that in that case, the theme and the mechanics don't necessarily line up. Even though the theme makes you feel something, that doesn't mean that it lines up with the mechanics. Eh, I think it's a minor point. That the dwarves are just kind of out on the side. <laughs> sure, I think I think the important point is that I think we care more about what happens to those locations and people in War of the Ring than we yes, do. Yes, but that's not necessarily well, a good thing because if it if it plays against the mechanics, then you have an, an inconsistency. Right, it one, needs one to thing. play the the theme has to play into the mechanics. The mechanics have to play into the theme. Well, one thing Rebellion does well, though, is uh, with capturing leaders, because you're attached to those specific characters. And right. Thus, yeah. And, and thus, the Empire capturing one of your leaders, or like capturing Luke or Leia or someone, feels really bad. But also, it works really well in that it ties into the mechanisms, because it's also very bad for you on a mechanical level. Right. Thinking about horror in board games... Um, Board games can't really do what I would call terror. So I, I this came from a Reddit post like a couple weeks ago that there there's this distinction, especially in Victorian literature, between terror and horror. And I think in modern day that we can branch that out into terror, horror, and thriller. 
where the Victorians, they, they define horror as a genre as being based in the feeling of disgust from seeing something terrible. Um, so like the, the, the sick feeling in your gut and you can get that, I think from board games, but what you really can't get and what I think that the, you know, our impossible theme quote unquote, impossible quote unquote theme, um, (laughs) that we're talking about is actually terror, which is this fear, abject, unbridled fear that relies on the unknown. It, that it preys on our insecurities and puts us into fight or flight mode and cold sweats and all of that. Like you can't, I don't know if you can get terror from a board game the way you could get it from a movie or a video game or even a book or an RPG or an RPG even. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, what you're calling terror is exactly what I was thinking of. Cause obviously you can make a board game that looks disgusting or is about something disgusting. I don't know if anyone has the bloody end. <laughs> the bloody end. Yeah, I, I suppose. Although I don't think it's it's not really trying to elicit a feeling of no. disgust. No. But I think you could. Like, you can with art, therefore you can with a board game. <laughs> right? Since you could just put disgusting art or horrific art in the game. Yeah. Although it, it would necessarily be weakened by the fact that you're then playing strategically with it. Yeah. Right. Again, like, all of the mechanics would work against it. Likely. Yeah. Um, right. But I think the question of terror is is the fun one. And the two problems I outlined were first that board games are open. You can look at all the components. Yeah. For the most part. Fog of War, a problem all over again. Yeah, in yeah. Sense. But even then, all the information's there. You can look at all the cards in a game. You can, you can see everything. You unpack the game. You maybe yeah. assembled part of it. Honestly, I think that there's a physiological and psychological side to this, too, because your your group is approaching this board game and your 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 brain is ramping up to, OK, I'm going to spend the next hour, the next two hours being cerebral. I'm going to spend the next two hours solving problems or right. like that's that's the gear that you're getting yourself into. And so it's almost like you're suppressing that like reptilian hind brain that says, you know, eat or run you know what i mean right yeah right, right. Um, yeah that that's that's absolutely great wes i mean in contrast when you go to see a movie you you put yourself into that mood you're like i'm going to put myself into this movie and experience what the person's experience which makes you hyper ready to yeah be a suspension of disbelief yeah Right. So it's almost like your own brain is working against you where you're getting into this computational mode instead of a reactionary mode. But I think that, that a, a sort of subgenre here that I didn't really define um, a second ago of thriller is where board games excel. Like they actually not only does it work, but with the right game, it works incredibly well. Well, so a thriller is defined as simulating stress. Um, simulating tension, suspension, okay. stress, and, re- and and release. And the board games that do that are like Battlestar Galactica and Resistance. But it's it's actually like in this moment of like you, you're in Resistance or a similar game and you're like, oh, oh man, I've been found out. You know, this is this is the end of me as a member of the Resistance or, the, you know, this is the end of me as a spy. Um, or Secret Hitler, even, when that assassination card gets played. So the, the, those games have oh, yeah. those... I think I really think. great moments of, of stress and suspension, but it's not fear. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's suspense, right? It's it's the Hitchcock thing where, you know, surprise is the bomb exploding. Suspen- uh, suspense is when you know there's a bomb there and there are people there. Uh, you know, uh, there's a bomb under the table and it doesn't explode. Yeah. Right. And board games are really good at that. You know, like you say, with the resistance, when like yeah, the suspense you, of finding out if you're if what you thought every is real push your luck mechanic, push your luck mechanics, anything where there's a significant like dice roll or like pandemic when you're drawing cards and you know, mm-hmm. and yeah. you know, one more epidemic could kill you. Yeah, yeah, anything like that, board games do really well. I immediately, I mean, thinking of horror, it's in board games, it's, it's impossible not to think of the Arkham games. So why do we think that those games? do or don't do the the theme well 
at least the ones I've played, well, Elder Tor is the only one I really remember. It's a problem. It's a it's a problem again with the mechanical thinking of playing a board game and the things that would create horror, and that's the problem of randomness. And so, or randomness, or or just the unknown, where the unknown and the resistance is great. Because it's very impactful, there's not that much, and all of it's about finding about that unknown. In Eldritch Horror, I find that it's just like, oh, another thing happened to me. Right, a bad thing's going to happen every... And it's just a matter of which flavor that bad thing's going to happen. So at some point, you get diminishing returns. You have diminishing returns on randomness. Okay. The more you have it, because then it just becomes another bit of randomness, rather than something, ooh, really terrifying and scary. Yeah. Or suspenseful. So I think back to it was, I mean, it was college when I played Arkham Horror. Um, Wes, you might have played it more than I did. Um, no, I, I've actually never played Arkham Horror. Oh, really? Okay. Well, Believe it or not, as, as close of friends as I am with Bubba and Stephanie, <laughs> I have never played Arkham Horror. I mean, my, my first thought is you could skin that game in whatever theme you want, and I don't know it would, that it would change the experience. Like, you could do it a Marvel-themed Arkham Horror and not change one actual gameplay yeah, mechanic. Anything where there's a large villain. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know that it would feel any different. And if I don't feel different playing H.G. Lovecraft versus playing Marvel, I don't think that it's doing the theme very effectively. Yeah. Well, let's try to think right. of... What would be what would be a possible solution to create? Like, how would we create kind of a board game that has terror? I don't know if there is a solution, honestly. Like, this is one where I really don't think that there is, unless yeah, you did because... something like, unless you did something unethical. Because the like, other thing is that you have to have something big at stake. What that's are you? True. What are you going to put at stake? Like. I think the only thing that you could do is that, like, you're out of the game, which would be... Which is unsatisfying. Which is unsatisfying. Right. You know, I if, was thinking... if it's just, like, you lose, you know, 30% of your income or something, nah, that's not going to terrify right. anybody. Right. I was thinking almost, like, real-world implications of, like, you have to go sit in an empty closet listening to horror soundtracks for... Oh. Five minutes, have or you, have like either of you played like Quelf? Oh, that game's horrible. There's a game that there's a game that Quelf, <laughs> inflicts terror. Quelf, what that's am I true. Have to do? That's true, but that's a party game. Do we really want to talk it's about a party the game? Terror of embarrassment. Yeah, and shame. Yeah, right. but that's got to be the closest thing to actual terror. Well, I think the closest thing is is an RPG, and I think I agree with Mark there. I think because it precisely because it creates stakes because yeah. you become attached to the character. Yeah. Like I still remember back in college, Wes, when you nearly killed me when we were in that Star Wars RPG and there was like a talking statue. Do you remember that session? Um it was was this in the Sith temple that had all the traps in it? Yes. Okay. And you I don't had... remember the, I don't I don't remember what the statue did to you though. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you got to a point where you thought that we were all too complacent and too powerful. (laughs) And so you solicited advice from someone on how to DM it. And they said, you know, make them scared. And so you sent us to this temple and I got like a statue or something and I put it somewhere. And then you had someone, like you had it speak to me and say, do you want to die? Oh, it was a yes or no question, oh, right. and if you asked, if you answered incorrectly, you were going to die. And I, was, and I asked you later, was I actually, were you actually going to kill my character if I did the wrong thing? And you said <laughs> yes, but the point was, it felt like in that moment that you were like I totally believed that you were going to do it, and I love that after the fact you did say, yeah, I was going to do it, um, and I love that I actually survived by just shoving the statue off the pedestal. <laughs> Yeah, and refusing to answer the question. (laughs) But I think you have to have something like that because the DM has this information that other people don't. And, you know, obviously there has to be that trust between the players and the DM that the DM is acting, quote, unquote, fairly or, you know, in their interest for the story. 
Um, but I think you have to have that kind of situation to yeah. create terror. Yeah. You know the you know the the most I felt terror in that campaign because I don't think my character was ever in huge You're a harm. character. Yeah. I I yeah I went rogued it and stayed out of the way. Yeah, you were always hiding in the shadows. When I arranged for the the murder of the the party member that I couldn't stand. Oh yeah, we killed but, the like, party member. <laughs> like that was terrifying to go through with because like if we botched that i was probably going to be the one that's i because i'm I'm squishy you know well that was terrifying on multiple levels because we didn't know if we're going to be able to kill that character he was obviously way more powerful than all of us but also the yeah how would royster actually like as a person respond to it yeah right You, you guys were also confronting a character who like two sessions prior had Hold a miniature, like a, a normal size space station, out of orbit, and then come in and a into a planet. A race of lizard people. <laughs> yeah, it's true. But okay, but my point in bringing that up is that in role playing, if you you create the world, and then there are so many opportunities for human emotion, both GM created and character created. Yeah, I'm well, really interested in Geesman bringing up Quelf. That 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 really stirred something in me because. I loved how that game pushed boundaries. And yeah, it I I was at the heel of a lot of uncomfortable experiences in that game too. But I still think that it's a great party game. And yeah, I think that it's not just embarrassment, but I think that people do feel genuine fear yeah. playing that game. Like I was an Which awkward, is great. I was an awkward college kid. I think the first time I played it, like I was probably playing with some girl that I thought was somewhat attractive. And just, like, I knew that there were cards that would make me hold the person's hand next to me for the rest of the wow. game. Wow. Seriously. Like, I think I think that, that yeah, I think that that's, <laughs> that's terror, right? Yeah, because it forces interaction. But you can easily imagine a more horrifying version of that game that makes you do really, like, really uncomfortable things. Yeah. I would never want to play it. Right, and this is not... I'm not recommending Quelf. I don't. I never particularly oh, enjoy. I I recommend Quelf wholeheartedly. Yeah, that's a stark see, I, difference between us. Yeah, and I I think that when I originally was thinking about this topic, I I went the super cynical and dark route, and I was thinking like unethical in in like actually trying to produce pain and torment. Right. Right. Um, Almost, almost like a saw board game where you, right. you know, you draw the wrong card and you have to like cut yourself. <laughs> like that's uh, that's the, to me that's. But then again, again, who would play that game? I'm sure yeah. that there's a market out there. There, there are people in Salem who drink blood on a regular basis. But I mean, like, it's it, there's a market for that, but it's a weird idea. Yeah, and like, who wants to design that and be like responsible for that? Yeah. I think, of course. I think in the board game sphere, like it has to be a party game, right? Here's my yeah. other thought: What about a legacy game? And or a legacy game could approximate the RPG thing. The legacy game thing could get closest, and like in Pandemic Legacy, like we kind of feared like a character dying. Well, it was but really th- impactful. There's there's that one mission where one of the characters. We can spoil Pandemic Legacy Season 1 at this point. Warning, if you haven't played Season 1 of Pandemic Legacy... Well, uh, you, we ended up tearing up a character yeah, yeah. pretty it's far through possible. the game. Yeah. And I remember feeling it, for sure. Wasn't it my character? I, I think it was. Yeah, it didn't, yeah. It, it didn't impact me that much. Maybe that's just me. But I think, I think there could be a Legacy game that does that kind of thing better. And I think it goes back to what we were talking about before with having, like, you know, in Pandemic Legacy, you do name your character and they do have traits. But you can, I think because you can swap in and out of them as much as you want and pass them around between missions, you don't... At least I didn't come, become particularly attached to my character as I would, like, a Descent character. Yeah, I had a weird connection to the team. In, in Legacy. Like, especially as we, like, picked our team and we found some good combinations, I felt yeah. really attached to the team that would be going on, yeah. on missions. So, the character that we ripped up 
was one half of a great pair. Yeah. And so, you know, well, first of all, you're ripping a, a, co- a component in half, which is very effective, I think, at creating horror. <laughs> but second, I know, like, okay, well, this other character that was really useful probably isn't going to be useful anymore. Probably not going to play with them again. You know, I had some kind of suspension of belief, belief um, attachment to the characters. Mm-hmm. So it was an impactful moment. Yeah. I think it works best in RPGs. I think the problem because it becomes if you're trying to create a board game that elicits like terror, you, you end up just making an RPG, which yeah. is fine. Right. The RPGs do it really yeah, well. Yeah, totally. Even that um, that indie game that we played at PAX East, it it just like said this is an R you know this is a board game, but it's an RPG. Yeah. And that's how it dealt with the apocalyptic experience in a way that it knew that it couldn't do as a board game. Yeah. Yeah. Let's move on, Matt, to your thing, your your addition to the list here. Yeah, so I think this, this comes from horror fairly well. I thought of uh, surrealism, and I mean, specifically the image that I have is very much the Dolly surrealism. Mm-hmm. Um, I think one temptation in thinking about board games is to just say that, you know, theme is just artwork, you know, slapped on and stuff. I hate and, that. Yeah, right, yeah, and... and we're trying to get away from that, I think, doing a good job. But you can definitely see, like, taking the amazing artwork of Dali and just slapping it onto a, a board game, and it would look really cool. You know, like, the crazy elephants with the, the you know, giraffe legs or, yeah, yeah. or whatever, and, you know, things that, you know, the board could have these crazy, like, double images where it's one thing, but it's also something else. I think there's possibility for just like the artwork itself, but where I think that this, I think surrealism would break down as a board game theme is every mechanic would necessarily work against the theme because in, you know, in a surrealist world, things don't make sense. Well, what, what does board gaming do? Well, well? I I disagree about that. I don't know that much about surrealism. Isn't it more about tapping into the unconscious? Um, so it's yeah. it's a combination of things. Basically, it's it's not just tapping into the un- unconscious. It's also about subver- subversion of reality, like conscious right. conscious subversion yeah. of saying but, that this reality is incorrect, and so I am going to impose my unconscious mind onto these real norms to create the surreal. Yeah. Okay. Well, how do you? How, what mechanics, board game mechanics, could possibly capture that? I think. Let me throw something out here. I think I might have it. Telestrations. It's like, the telephone game, but you're writing, you're drawing pictures. Pictionary? No, no, no. It's the one where yeah. you have, someone writes out like a phrase or an, something and someone draws a picture of it and then they pass it to the next person who, like, or. Oh, who telephone tra- Pictionary. Who, tra- who writes out what it is yeah. and then someone else tries to draw a picture of that description. Okay. Okay. In a very high, a very high level, level yeah. way. It's kind of like, surrealism because you're you're, you're okay a, you start with an established reality and then destroy it that's certainly better than anything i came up with right well i i, I don't know why but the tagline or whatever the the benediction of whose line is anyway popped into my head of you know the points don't matter right to, to, but to, to me that's what it to me that's to what yeah, that's that's to me that's what a surrealist so, board game would be would be just playing for fun and it's actually subverting the norms of what a board game is intentionally for oh. for humor and reflection. It has to be that, Wes. I think it has to be the board game isn't really a board game. And well, I, I, when you said that what what came to my mind was descent cuz I, you know, I love playing descent and I I don't like the game very much, but we had a, a magnificent time, and I would play it with you guys anytime. B or uh, B Double H, uh, Betray White House on the Hill. Um, you know these games that we don't think are very good games, but are fun. Don't listen to him, listeners. I love B Double H with a burning passion. I love, and I think it's a great I game. Here, I don't know if this is surrealist, but it is postmodern in that it, it, it's extremely postmodern, and there are obviously connections there. The game is called 1000 Blank White Cards. Oh yeah, that's that was another game that like Stephanie played in college. It's literally just 1000 Blank White Cards and you just 
make a game. Well, it's Quelf, except that you, the players. No, I'm right pretty sure it's page. just a stack of cards. Yes, but you I'm don't have you, to make right. something. I'm like explaining Quelf. the game to you. Right. That's, that's it, one game that it could turn into, and it probably turns into that game more often than it turns into other games. Oh, sure, yeah. In, in the same way that a Transformer usually turns into a car and not an airplane, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah, right. Yes, I, I'm not convinced at all by, by these examples, because I think it's proving the point that... But isn't that the ultimate subversion of a board game? Right, but surrealism isn't just subversion. It's trying to create some kind of epiphany through subversion okay and yeah, but so in it, in what i'm imagining is like shoots and ladders in an mc escher painting <laughs> yeah, yeah no and that's what i imagine too wes but the 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 thing is the point is that one wouldn't be in a fun board game except as a novelty and and this gets back to what i was saying earlier of like the mechanics and the theme have to play into each other I think every mechanic that we think of as a board game mechanic would play against this idea of things aren't what they seem. You know, you can't track anything. You know, where, where do you sure. have some kind of token to track? You know, if you make it an adventure game with a surreal theme, then all of you, you know, your tracking of your health and your tracking of the items you've c- collected or whatnot is all going to play against because that's tangible. It's not surreal. Yeah. yeah. Well, just the, just making choices is probably against it. Making choices that have, yeah. That have uh, consequences. Consequences that you can, you know. Yeah. I know there's a game out there that's like a super niche game that some guy made um, about a psychedelic drug trip. And apparently it's very well done. That might get kind of close, but I don't know. I, I don't know yeah. much more than that. Yeah. Yeah, I think you've, you've nailed... A uh, an impossible theme. Woo. At least for doing the impossible game. every day. <laughs> All right. Well, and your last one was romance, right? Yeah, romance was the other one that I came up with. I really just came up with it because I think it's interesting to see how games try and fail to capture a theme. So we all love Love Letter. It's a great short little sit around the table. You know, you can. You can joke and have a conversation while you're playing it. I think Love Letter falls into this weird category of games that you can play in an airport terminal. Yeah. (laughs) Or on an airplane. Yeah. (laughs) What? You don't want to drop your tokens of affection onto the airplane floor. So I think the interesting thing is that Love Letter, it's kind of fun. You can be coy and play into the story of trying to get your letter to the princess. But at the end of uh, end of the the day, you're collecting tokens, and like the idea of quantifying romance in this pile of tokens, square cubes. That's square. the way to my art. It's <laughs> just cubes. <laughs> just cubes. Geometric cubes, cubes all the way down. <laughs> just geometric <laughs> geometric shapes in general, or just cubes. And cubes are great. You know, you have, sharp. You have a nice variety, like in Terra Mystica. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I don't know. What do you guys think? Love Letter's fun, but I think it, it doesn't actually capture romance. <laughs> well, Love Letter is one of those games where you could, and they have, put right. any theme you want on it. Yep, yep. Have yeah. you seen uh, how many Love totally. Letters are out there? There's like Batman. Yeah. There's Marvel. Marvel. There's, I don't even, there's, well, there's a million Love Letters. Oh, out. um. Well, it, it's meant to be lighthearted, right? And yes. I, I think that. Maybe maybe it's the fatalist in me, but I, I think that romance isn't fully lighthearted. Like, there's a weight and a substance to it that you totally. can't communicate. Like, it, and Love Letter kind of does disservice to the theme of romance, but we all accept it because it does disservice to the theme in a way that we can all relate to because we grew up with the princess and the Prince Charming story. How can you capture, like, self-sacrifice in a board game? That doesn't really make any I, sense. I, I mean, you can. Yeah, I don't think but you usually can. Usually, not in a romantic context, like in a in a you know any kind of cooperative game. Oh, you cooperative. Can have sacrifice. Yeah, that's a good yeah, point. Yeah. That's a good point. But it's usually not a romantic setting. So... Yeah, that's interesting. And it would well, and then it would be really awkward to create a, a game where you were actually like trying to pair up. Like, I guess that would be what you would have to do to. Oh my gosh, I would love that game. <laughs> <laughs> I would. Imagine, I would love like, that game so much. Can you imagine like a. Isn't that playing what at a, the bottle is? a table with seven people, Wes? Is that oh. a number of people? <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> no. 
that's that's a nightmare scenario right there. I was I was I wish we had video right now because I I want to see what my face just looked like because uh, in one moment I was looking wistfully up at the ceiling, thinking about this beautiful game of pairing up strangers and trying to fall in love with each other over the course of thirty minutes, and then you said that and I was like, oh god, no. <laughs> You could conceive of a game where the goal is to not necessarily pair up, but like gain, you know, create a, a sense of like emotional in, intimacy or something like that. And I, and I know there's a game that tries to do this called And Then We Held Hands. Okay. Which oh, I almost backed it on Kickstarter, but I the gist of it is that it's a two player co op game. And I think it's kind of a spatial spatial puzzle of trying like you have two pawns and they're trying to reach a center point or something and the whole game i think is built around like working out compromises and you know working together but giving up you know someone gives up something so the other person can gain something and so trying to it tries to simulate a relationship or romance that way and it's another game I'd, I'd like to play i don't know if i'd want to own it but i'd like to play it just to see how well it does something like that and so I think the realm of co-op games is where there's the most potential here. But I think it'd be incredibly difficult to do. I don't know how you do it. I can't think of a co-op game, you know, get, broadening it a little bit from romance, just like the sense of kinsmanship. I can't think of a game that I've really felt that, you know, in terms of like self-sacrifice, like you watch Lord of the Rings and like what, what Sam would do for Frodo. You know, you know, I've and never. It's romance. It's a different kind. Sure. sure. Yeah, we we just yeah. We, we've been going back to the Lord of the Rings well so frequently. <laughs> yeah, well, it's good. That, that's all. So but specifically, Sam. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, Mr. Frodo. I can't think of a, a co-op game that I've like felt that sense of self-sacrifice yeah. for the team. Again, yeah. it's almost like we're trying to create an RPG here. Yeah, totally. You, yeah, you again. It's something that works out really well in RPGs. Yeah, I think you could do it in board games, though. You have to have some kind of stakes to it, because because the, the oh. problem is like in Descent, you could have where someone like throws themselves in something in front of the monster, but they're they're just gonna like regenerate, you know, for the next yeah. mission. But how do you prevent the stakes from becoming too real? Yeah, that's the problem. Hmm. It's like. You're obviously going between two extremes and trying to find a good middle point, but in some cases there isn't a middle point to be found. Well, that's how do you answer sense. that question for role playing, Wes? Well, to, to me, it's a completely different medium because you have, I mean, if you if your character quote unquote falls in love with another player character, you guys have months of sessions to hash that out and what that means and like how that impacts your friendship with that person in real life if it's you know if it's a gender bending or sexuality bending situation like this this is getting in all sorts of adult themes that we don't necessarily need to get into but you have this time and this real world relationship to work that out because your character in the game is an expression of your personality on a deep and fundamental level. You, at least usually that's how it is. Whereas with a board game, you need to, you, you just usually just detach from it unless it's like a legacy game. You just detach from it as soon as you're done with it. And if I'm going to play a board game, I'm one of those people that falls in love with strangers on a disconcertingly regular basis. And if I'm going to sit down and play a board game and not actually fall in love, but feel romance towards someone else to have that just cut at the end of the game and then to go about life like that. To me, that sounds painful. Yeah. And I, I, I don't want that to happen. I would rather have the turmoil of a continuing emotional story that would happen with an RPG. But I mean, you, you I, I think that you could emulate romance in a board game, but without the the temporally lengthening of it across multiple sessions yeah it, you, you can't you, you don't have a way to fully hash it out in two hours yeah you know we haven't tackled the question at all of you know should you tackle themes in a board game this might be the one that i would most quickly come down on the side of of no like there are good mediums for exploring romance and even just kinsmanship but you know 
written their books. There are, you know, for goodness sakes, go watch Peter Jackson's Return of the King. <laughs> um, oh my God. You know, well, I mean, just those mediums do it better than I think board games ever will. Well, there's a there's a but difference between role play for goodness sakes. Well, there's a difference between also if we're thinking of a game tackling the theme of romance of a game that's trying to get you to feel romantic toward another player in the game, and a game that is trying to get you to make the kind of choices that one has in a romantic relationship. Right, right. Um, does, does that affect how you respond to the should you question? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, but if it but if it's a game that forces you to make those choices, then how do you keep it from becoming rote and dissolving into that's mechanics? Another, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a, the that's the hard question right, for right. sure. Yeah. You you could put a lot of effort into making it work only to realize that you, you just, just broke romance down to A, B, or C. <laughs> yeah. Well, which or is which is what some becomes, some people make a living out of doing that. Yeah. Like that's what pickup artists are. Yeah. That's true, yeah. If my board game is being compared to pickup artists, then I'm doing something wrong. Yeah, no, that's the point, though. That's the yeah, point. Yeah, right, right. There's certain things, huh? Maybe that'll be a podcast for another time. Is themes that should not be, <laughs> they should never be used. Should, should not be <laughs> done. Yeah, for that the, reason. These are the themes, the dark themes, sealed in the vault. <laughs> the unspeakable themes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. themes, themes that shall not be named. <laughs> oh gosh! Oh man! Now oh, that's a really interesting. This one you went down a this, dark path there. Yeah. This no. This particular the romance one has, has got me thinking, but I don't have any clear thoughts. So oh, we we can return to it another time. Yeah, maybe we'll talk about it later. Any other comments you guys maybe, have on this? Maybe in February we'll have a romance episode, <laughs> a Valentine's Day episode. <laughs> Any other thoughts on anything we've talked about here? Nope. I don't think so. I mean, it's 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 exciting to see a game that is tackling a new theme. But, you know, and, and I've had that experience a lot in the last couple of years. And, and that's exciting. Uh, yeah. But also, it can, it can so, uh, frequently, it comes down to feeling like, oh, we've reskinned the same sort of thing. Yeah, and that's part of what drew me to this topic is because I love games that have interesting themes or not not by not interesting unique things that haven't necessarily been done before things yeah. that you wouldn't think would be the theme of a board game but when you really think about it sometimes it's such a huge design challenge to go away from kind of the established themes because of just the way board games are yeah but I think it's a worthy challenge to think about and, you know, yeah, and from it, a design standpoint to try to overcome these problems. Because then that's, I feel like that's how you get to like new mechanisms and new genres of games is you really try to work through these puzzles and these problems that come about because of the limitation of board games. Like it's been said a lot of times by many people that, you know, art is enhanced when you have limitations. Mm -hmm. There's the filmmaking saying that there's the movie you go out you set out to make it, and then there's the movie you end up making while you're trying to make that movie. And that's especially true when you have, you know, a lot of limitations. And it's less true when you have all the money in the world and all the, you know, computers that can do everything. So I think the limitations of a board game create some really interesting thought processes and challenges that could make for some interesting games. Or maybe, or, and probably also a lot of busts or games that just turn into RPGs. <laughs> Yeah, as we've as we found. Yeah, that's our podcast for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to check out the website at thethoughtfulgamer.com. Hit me up on Twitter and Facebook. And don't forget to rate and review this podcast on iTunes. And again, if you do enjoy this podcast and if you want to watch a live stream of us recording it, which we are doing for the first time today at this very moment, go to the Patreon page. Every Patreon supporter will get access to the live stream so you can see uh, all the stuff that I edit out, all the horrible jokes, and talking about Samwise Gamgee too much. I think that's a really awesome reward, and we have all kinds of other rewards there as well. Again, that's patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. We'll talk to you again soon. Goodbye. Samwise Gamgee is his own reward. <laughs> so you're saying that you're going to edit out Samwise parts? I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs>